Hey, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here today. And if you have your Bibles, hopefully you do turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Yes, we'll get there in just a moment. Um, Let me just share a little bit with you about me, uh, my family. I've been married to my wife, Jamie, in eight or nine days. It will be 20 years that we've been married. So we're celebrating next week. Very excited about that. We have three kids that we're so proud of. Ethan just graduated high school, and we have Kayla and Blake. They're going to be juniors at Urbandale, and so we're very proud of each and every one of them. I do want to also say that if you ever have missed a Sunday morning or you would like to go back and listen to any of the sermons and the services that happen, you can go onto our YouTube channel, New Hope Assembly, Urbandale or New Hope Urbandale, and you can watch the services. Um, Also, if you go on Spotify, if those of you who have Spotify, you can listen to the sermon portion of the services. And so you can go back and and do either one of those. I encourage you to do that. Um, And like Pastor Luke said, come back tonight. We have testimonies. Nothing more encouraging than testimonies of what God has done in someone's life. And we're going to hear from teams that have gone to El Salvador and uh, also students who went to, to camp this past week. And so encourage you to come back tonight for that. All right, Hebrews chapter 12. This is verse 14. We're in our series titled Holiness, or I mean of, of um, yeah, of, of holiness. And this is what it says. Work at living in peace with everyone. This is the New Living Translation. And work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. And I do have to say this, that none of this would be possible without the Holy Spirit helping us. Amen? None of this is possible. So this isn't something that we work up on our own strength and our own effort. This is a partnership with the Holy Spirit helping us do this. And so today... Um, As as I talk through, there's a lot of scriptures that I'm going to be reading. Some will be up on the the big Bible on the screens, and some you're just going to have to write down so you can read later. But, man, I I encourage you to always bring your Bible to church. Amen? This is is what I prefer. Um, I'm thankful for technology, but I would prefer just to have a, a paper Bible, you know, with pages that I can turn. I don't get distracted. Anybody else feel the same way? It's like, I just need this. This is my preferred way of doing it, but I'm thankful for a lot of technology. So write down the, the scriptures that we're, we're going to be talking about today, and you can go back this week, and you can read through them and just kind of go over what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. So we heard in last week's message, and also from this verse in Hebrews, that holiness is important, right? Holiness is important uh, based on Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, because we want to see God. That's part of the reason why holiness is important. Uh, there's people who are lost, they're, they're lost in sin, they're hurting, they're broken, they're looking for something that's different, and they're looking for something that stands out, and holiness stands out. Wouldn't you agree in our society, in our culture today, holiness looks different than what our culture is used to, right? And even back then, when, when, when Jesus was walking on this earth, and even before then, um, holy people stood out differently, and there was something different about them. Now, holiness means to be pure, means to be set apart, separate, different, dedicated. Um, we, we heard last week from Pastor Zach and Pastor Luke, um, part of holiness is being empty, emptying ourselves of, of sin and things that don't honor God, and then being filled, filled with God's word, filled with the things of God, so that we can become more like Christ and be more like him. God's character is absolutely morally pure. He sets himself apart from everyone and everything, doesn't he? And I'm thankful that we have someone to look to to help us. And yet, God calls us to be holy because he's holy. And this is repeated throughout the Bible, to be holy as he is holy. And I do want to say that sometimes this when we hear the word holy, it feels unattainable. Would anybody else agree with that? It feels unattainable, like I can't do this. I can't be perfect. I can't, you know, pray enough. I can't sing worship songs enough to be holy. And that you're absolutely true. 
We can't, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from Jesus Christ helping us, we can't. And so this is a process as we grow in our faith, as we give our life to Jesus Christ and that we pursue him, there's this process that the Holy Spirit begins to reveal things in our hearts and reveal things in our life through his word um, to change, to, to deal with. And that's the process of becoming more like Christ, the process of becoming holy. We also heard last week that sin isn't just pollution, it's poison, right? Sin is poison to us. It's not just like, well, it's a bad thing. This is poison to our soul. And this impacts every one of us, doesn't it? It impacts all of us here. No one is, is free from sin. Romans 3.23 says, for everybody has sinned. We've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God, God's standards. Romans 6.23, you know this. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And so last week we talked about purity. And today we're talking about the holiness characteristic of humility. All right. So if you're taking notes, you can write down the word humility or you'll, it'll be on the screen. Um, pride versus humility. Pastor, I, I jokingly said this to Pastor Jeff who's speaking in the chapel today. I said, maybe our title should be the greatest sermon you've ever heard. Right? <laughs> be fun. Anyways, we're talking about humility today. So here's what I want you to do. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about me. All right. All of you just showed some pride right there. Good job. So listen, the Christian life following Jesus begins with humility, doesn't it? Following Jesus, it starts with repenting. Repenting. Repenting is admitting that we are sinful, that we're wrong, and we're committing to live this new life and go this new direction following him. We're turning away from the direction that we have been going. We repent and we turn and we're pursuing Christ. We're pursuing him. Wouldn't you agree? It takes humility to admit that you're wrong, right? That is not easy for any one of us. And in order to follow Christ... It starts with humility, doesn't it? To admit, I need a savior. I cannot do this on my own. I need someone to help me. Here's what pride does, though. Pride closes the door of spiritual growth, doesn't it? Pride will close that door so quickly because we don't see a need for a savior. We don't see a need for help because we've got it. Humility, on the other hand, will open up the door for God's graces and for God's help. The Bible even says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So at the end of my message today, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask us to respond in prayer. And even right now, as, as I begin to kind of go through some of these scriptures, would you ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart, reveal anything. Maybe there's pride in your life on some level, some form that either you are aware of or maybe you're not aware of. And begin to ask him and reveal that to, to you. And we're gonna take time to pray at the end. Pride is celebrated in our world. It's very common to see it you know, uh, flaunted in the position that someone has at work, the CEO, the CFO, the COO, and whatever all the C's you can fill in. You know, it's like everybody wants a title. Um, everybody wants to show off all their possessions. Everybody wants to brag about themselves and all their accomplishments, right? It's, it's everywhere. And it, we, we probably are so absorbed into this society of pride that we may not even realize it at times. Wouldn't you agree? Or sometimes, if you're like me, sometimes it's easier to point out pride in some, somebody else or something else rather than it is ourselves. Wouldn't you agree? It's like, man, that person's prideful. But yet when it comes to us, we're like, nah, nah, I'm fine. I'm not prideful. I'm good. So I want to share some of these symptoms of pride. Um, and maybe you can identify with some of these symptoms of pride. And you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to nudge the person next to you say, hey, he's talking about you on these. Okay, but symptoms of pride. Preoccupation with your appearance. Symptoms of pride. You're needy of attention. Pride says, hey, look at me. I'm over here. Notice me. Pride is disrespectful towards authority. Pride, re pride rebels against authority. Pride is argumentative. The root cause of a person who's argumentative is pride and fear. This person, they're not secure, and so they, they feel like they always have to be right. 
Pride is self-centered, preoccupied with self. Pride is arrogant and boastful. The Bible talks about um, having haughtiness or haughty eyes. You know, it's this boastful looking down on others while elevating yourself. Pride, here's one, reluctant to admit fault. Pride resists acknowledging mistakes and weakness and sinfulness, entitlement, ingratitude, prayerlessness, rebellion. These are all symptoms of pride, and I realize there's probably more. And so as I talk through today on on pride versus humility, I already know that I'm not going to cover everything. And so don't feel the need that you have to come up and tell me, say, you forgot this story in the Bible or you forgot this scripture. I get it. There's so much. In fact, if... If you step back and you look at the issue of pride, um, it's been happening since day one, right? Since, since Adam and Eve walked onto this earth, pride has been there. And so there's an element of pride, honestly, in almost every situation that we read about in the Bible. And so my prayer is that as we read these scriptures and as we talk through pride versus humility, that the Holy Spirit would speak to you. So let's pray right now. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We thank you for... Um, the power of your word. We thank you that your word does not return void. And so as we hear what you're saying to us, would you speak to us? Holy Spirit, convict us if there's any area of pride and how we can humble ourselves before you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. All right, so turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 7. It'll be up on the screen, but I encourage you to also read along. Uh, Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 15, and then we'll jump to verse 18. This is Jesus speaking. He says, it's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Verse 18 Jesus says, can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but it only passes through the stomach and then out of your body. By saying this, Jesus declared that every kind of food is is acceptable in God's eyes. And then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within, and they are what defile you. Romans chapter 1, starting verse 28, says, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking. And he let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand They break their promises, they're heartless, and they have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. This feels like a who's who's list of big sins, doesn't it? Like these are some big Uh, big ticket things that we read about. And in the midst of these two lists that I just read, pride is in there, isn't it? Pride is right there with, with the other sins. It even says that this is a sin deserving of death. So pride is a very serious sin. Understand this. It's a very serious sin before God. And the Bible has a lot to say about pride. And usually... In fact, all, all the time, I have not read one verse about pride that has anything good to say about it, right? And so, as I go through these, uh, write these qu- quick hit uh, verses down, and you can go back later. All of these are f- from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs six sixteen. there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests, and the very first one is haughty eyes. Haughty eyes means this, is that you're proud, you're boastful, it's all about you, and you're looking down upon somebody else like you're not good enough. That is haughtiness right there. So when the Bible says to us that God hates something, don't you think we should listen? Don't you think that we should probably start writing down, okay, God, what is it that you hate? 
because I don't want to do this. I don't want to live like this. Whatever is to follow when God says, I hate this, it's a matter of eternal importance. All right, here we go. Proverbs 16, 5. The Lord detests all the proud of hearts. Proverbs 8, 13. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. Proverbs 11, 2. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You've heard that one before. I'm sure we've quoted that one before. Proverbs 29, 23, pride ends in humiliation while humility brings honor. Proverbs 21, verse four, haughty eyes, a proud heart and evil actions are all sin. Real quick, how many of you would say you've had a moment where you were humbled in front of somebody, in front of a group of people, you had some humiliation happen, yeah? It happens. If there was a video that could sum up pride and humility very quickly, I would say that this video is something that uh, would sum it up. Are you guys ready? Watch the boy. Gives the peace sign. Boom, he's down. You guys see it? (laughs) Let's watch it again one more time. Okay. Watch him. He gives the peace sign like, I got you. And he's down. (laughs) That's just a little glimpse into my sense of humor, by the way. But (laughs) pride goes before the destruction, right? Humiliation usually um, is what comes after pride. And I'm sure that we could all think of a story or two from your life of you being humiliated or being prideful or someone in your life or situation. But there's also a lot of stories in the Bible that we could point to. And so um, as I share a few of these today, um, I want you to know that the goal is not to Uh, The goal today is to learn how to overcome and avoid what God hates. God hates pride. And so how do we overcome this? It's by being humble, by humbling ourselves before God. So here's a few illustrations from the Bible. The Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, right? They're building this tall tower to, you know, reach the sky. And they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. And if you know what happens, you understand that that did not take place. King Nebuchadnezzar, right? Think of him. Max Lucado writes about King Nebuchadnezzar and he says this, King Nebuchadnezzar had no peers. He was the uncontested ruler of the world of the sixth century BC Babylon. His city rose out of the desert plains like a Manhattan skyline. The hanging gardens of Babylon, which legend says that he built for his wife, were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. His royal palace was immense. Its walls were 387 feet high and 87 feet thick. Four chariots abreast could ride on them. The mighty Euphrates flowed through his city. Its population reached two million people. It boasted temples, terraces, and palaces. All of this was under the 43-year dominion of Nebuchadnezzar. Max Licato writes, he was part oil baron, part royalty, part hedge fund billionaire. Were he alive today, he would dominate the Forbes list of billionaires. And in Daniel chapter 4, starting verse 30, this is what it says. King Nebuchadnezzar says, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Verse 31, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals and you will eat grass like the ox. Think of Jonah also, Jonah in the Bible. I don't want to go to them. You know, I'm better. They don't deserve this. You know, let them let them rot. Let them let them uh, get paid for the evil things that they're doing. There's a there's a sense of pride there. 
The Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 3 says God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. Matthew 5, 5, God blesses those who are humble or the meek shall inherit the earth. All aspects of being humble. Think of Peter, right? Peter, you're going to deny me. No, 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 I will never deny you, Lord. What happens? He denies him. There's, a, there's a, a sense of pride almost throughout everywhere. And if we're not careful, church, this can invade our hearts if it hasn't already. We have to always be humble and asking God for our help. Everything that God's word says to us, everything that, that God through his word asks of us requires humility, doesn't it? Everything. And it starts with being humble. It starts with uh, humbling ourselves before God. Here's what happens. Pride prevents humility and humility is what leads us to repentance humility is a step of repentance this is why God hates pride right one of the reasons God hates pride is because it prevents us from getting to know him right we think we've got it all we've got it all together we're, we're self-made we're okay all the while we don't realize our need for Christ so to overcome pride we have to humble ourselves. Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 is a story that I think can also sum up pride versus humility. It's good to hear pages turning, isn't it? It says this, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everybody else. So this is uh, happening even then in Jesus' time frame. People had great confidence in their own righteousness and their, their own goodness, and they were looking down on everybody else. Verse 10 of Luke 18 says, Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. Tax collectors back then were despised. They took money. They stole from you. They upcharged you so they could pocket some of it. Nobody would like to be able to pay their taxes then and back, back then, or now and back then. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In this story, we have two characters that symbolize pride and humility. One shows us what God hates. The other shows us how to overcome it. Um, for one, one, one person, the Pharisee, if you think of pride, it's boastful, isn't it? And in the NIV, I think it says, um, he prayed about himself to God. He's boastful. And also as he's boasting, he's um, looking down on somebody else. He's looking down saying, I'm, I'm glad I'm not as bad as this person here. A judgmental spirit. The pride is there. And on the other side of the coin in the situation is this tax collector who knew he was wrong, who knew that he was a sinner, and he's asking God for mercy. He's asking God to forgive him. His focus was looking up and not looking down on other people. This is a great example and, uh, and, and I wonder, and I'm sure that this Pharisee had this long list of accolades, right? The, the Pharisees loved to, to flaunt who they were back then, didn't they? They loved to stand on the street corners and pray so everybody can see. They loved to have these long prayers so everybody knew they were very important, very smart, very spiritual. They had this long list of accolades of all that they had accomplished. And I'm sure that if we wanted to, we could have a long list of accomplishments too that we could stack up, you know? I was born, you know, when I was born, I gave my life to the Lord at seven years old. I was baptized shortly after that. I've been to multiple camps, been to multiple missions trips. Uh, I've been in the church my entire life. I haven't known a time in my life that I wasn't in the church. Um, 
been tithing for a good portion of my life. I've been teaching Sunday school and teaching classes. And if we're not careful, we can be like the Pharisee, can't we? Where we can have this judgmental, prideful heart that honestly can prevent us from even coming to the altar to pray and say, I need you, God. Jesus, I need your help. I need your grace and I need your mercy. God hates pride. And there's nothing that is more blinding to ourself than pride. If we only see ourselves, listen, church, please listen. If we only see ourselves, we have no need for a savior. If, if we've got it all together, why do we need Christ? But we fail to recognize and realize that the only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 says there's, no, there's salvation in no one else. Amen. There's no one, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So if it's pride versus humility, humility is the antidote. Humility is the answer. Jesus made it clear that he came to serve and not to be served, didn't he? Real quick, think of, hear these out. The start of some of these letters of the New Testament, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, listen what, how they describe themselves. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. All of them recognized their role in the kingdom of God and it was to serve and obey God. When Jesus says we need to serve and not to be ser served, he says in Mark 9.35, whoever wants to be first must be last and be the servant of everybody else. Philippians chapter 2, starting verse 5, says this, we should have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. All right, so what is that attitude? We should have the same attitude, so what is it? In verse six, it says, though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, listen to this. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you, dress yourselves in humility. Some translations say, put on humility. As you relate to one another, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up. James chapter 4, starting in verse 6. These are powerful scriptures. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Before we read those scriptures, when you hear the word humility, we might think that it's this nice, nice, cute, easy word. You know, like someone who's humble would say, all right, I'm going to let someone else have my seat and I'll stand, you know, so they can have a seat. It's like, um, how, how can we just be kind and, and polite and let someone else choose where they're going to go to eat instead of what you want, right? I mean, that's sometimes what we think about of being humble. But when we read these scriptures we realize there's an obedience piece to this that is very difficult. For Christ to humble himself and become obedient to death. Don't you think that was a difficult choice? A difficult thing to, to wrestle with? When we have to humble ourselves before the Lord, it's, it's taking God's scriptures and, and, and the word of God and aligning, aligning our heart up with it. So when it says... You know, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't murder, all these things. We have to align ourselves up with God's word. And that part of that means humbling ourselves and realizing I need to align myself up with this. That's a humbling piece. Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century said, The best defense that anyone can have against the wiles of the devil is a humble heart. Nothing sets a person 
so much out of Satan's reach as humility. Humility is a great protection against falling headlong into Satan's trap. And here's what he says. Besides, it's hard to fall down when you're already prostrate before God. Amen? Church, I I want us to always remember and realize our need for a Savior. Our need for salvation, our need for forgiveness, our need for grace, our need for mercy. And I think if we can be it in that constant um, thought and spirit and heart and prayer um, about this, that will impact how we treat people, right? Too many times we, look, we can look down on somebody else. We can judge them for the sin and the things that we think they're doing that is wrong all the while we don't realize their creator is my creator and I need forgiveness just like they need forgiveness. And so if there's an area of pride, um, of boastfulness, of haughtiness in your heart today, would you continue to ask the Holy Spirit to help you and, and realize that? So how do I know if I'm prideful? Let me run through a couple of things because honestly, sometimes it is difficult to, to recognize it. It operates subtly and, and deceives us. So how do I know if I'm prideful? Are you more concerned with promoting yourself rather than considering other people? Do you struggle with a sense of superiority or inferiority to relate to other people? Do you resist constructive criticism and confessing your wrongdoings? Is it hard to you know, ask for forgiveness? Do you justify your errors instead of just asking for forgiveness? Do you boast about your achievements, your talents, your possessions in conversations as you're talking to people? Are you um, one-upping? Like, yeah, I, oh yeah, well, I did this, you know? Do you fail to recognize God's role in your life? Do you struggle with submitting to God's will and follow his commandments? Do you resist the authority figures and struggle with this rebellious attitude? Listen, pride has a crafty way of, of taking hold in our heart, doesn't it? And, and if we're not careful, we can fall victim and we can give in to this poison of sin. So as we grow in our walk with the Lord, as we mature, we should mature, right? As we become more like Christ, we should become more mature and Holy, or um, be, being humble is a sign of maturity in the kingdom of God. We realize our need for Jesus and where we would be without him. So just because we're older doesn't mean we're mature. Just saying, right? Just because you're in your 60s and 70s and 80s doesn't mean spiritually that you're mature. Humility is a sign of maturity in the kingdom of God. Think of the apostle Paul. He died in about 66 AD. He became a follower of Christ about 30 years prior. So he was, he was a follower of Christ for about 30 years. And, um, and worship team, if you would join me on the platform. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he, or the whole book, Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians about 10 years before he died. All right, So he had been a follower of Christ for approximately 20 years. So he writes 1 Corinthians and notice what Paul says in verse 15, chapter 15, verse 9. He says, I am the least of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Ten years before he's passing. About seven years later, three years before he passes, he writes uh, the church to uh, the, the letter to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 3. He says, although... I am less than the least of all God's people. This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Two years later, about a year before Paul passes away, he writes in 1 Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul, as he goes along, as he matures in his walk with the Lord, he begins to have this assessment of who he is and where he stacks up. You know, he, he gave, he has a, a long list of accolades he could boast about. But the older that he got and the more mature he got in his relationship with the Lord, the more he realized his need 
for Christ, the more he realized I am nothing. I am nothing without Jesus. And that's my prayer for us, is that we would continue to daily realize and remember our need for a savior, our need for his forgiveness. Start with being humble, with humility. Second Chronicles 7, 14. You've heard this before, but I want to read it again. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land if my people will humble themselves. The answer isn't with self. The answer is in God. Amen. So humility begins by humbling yourself before God. Would you close your eyes in order to block out distractions? Before we sing, before we respond and do anything else, would you search your heart? Would you humble yourself before the Lord Admit your need for Jesus. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, we are lost. Thank him for that. There's no other name that we can be saved but through Jesus. Thank him for that. Humble yourself. time to pray so I encourage you to respond I really encourage you to respond by coming forward and I realize we just talked about pride you know and and it's easy to stay where we're at because we don't think we're that bad to have to go in front right we could be like the Pharisee and say I'm at least I'm not like this you know when we come to the altar it's it's humbling ourselves before the lord and i realize that can happen anywhere honestly but there's something about coming forward and so as we sing in just a little bit i encourage you to come forward if there's an area of pride the holy spirit has revealed it spoken to your hearts and you need to, you want to come forward to confess and to humble yourself i encourage you to do so but i want to remind you of the book of Revelation in chapter 3 there's words that are written to the church in Laodicea and it describes them as being lukewarm you know and, and Jesus says I'd rather you be hot or cold you know don't don't be dualistic here be hot or be cold but he, he goes on to describe this church and he says you have all that you need right that's your attitude you have all the riches you're good you're 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 self-made you're self-sufficient in your mind you have no need for help 
But then he says, I encourage you to come to me. Come to me for the gold. Come to me for the, the, the purity. Come to me for the righteousness. And I want to challenge us in that is that sometimes we feel like we're good. We've got it. I accomplished a lot. Congratulations. That's your reward right now. But I feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to us and say, listen, come to Jesus. He's the one that will provide all that you need. He's the one that helps you in every situation. He's the one who saves us. Amen. So as we sing and as we pray, I encourage you to respond to the Lord. Real quick before we sing, would you close your eyes? If you would say, I struggle with pride. This is an area that doesn't get talked about a lot, but I know that I struggle with pride and I'm asking God to help me. Would you respond by raising your hand and say, God, that's me. I struggle with this and I need your help. Jesus, would you forgive me? Jesus, would you set me free? Would you help me? Jesus, see our hearts. We need your help.